Why don't you look at the capacity aspect of who you are and approach it from there first and then turn around and realize it's not about transferring motivational spirit. It's about transformation and transformation is ugly. It's destructive and it happens in the dark corners. And until you experience that, you're actually not outside your comfort zone. Your proverbial comfort zone is just the thing your ego is telling you you're feeling and you're not really outside of it. When you're outside of it, you're going to know because you're going to be scared. You're going to feel out of control and you're going to feel uncertainty and you're going to realize Oh my gosh, this is where the rubber meets the road, and this is where I need to either embrace it or I can turn tail and run. Welcome to the Seven Hats Podcast. My name is Yuval Selig, and I've been on the entrepreneurial roller coaster for over 20 years. I've experienced it all throughout my journey the grind, burnout, failure, and ultimately, success. The turning point for me was realizing that building a successful company is meaningless if you neglect the other significant areas of your life. So today, I'm inviting you to join me on an adventure through those seven areas, what I call the seven hats. Every week, my guests and I will drop valuable insights and pearls of wisdom, helping, motivating, and inspiring you to get your seven hats in order and deliver real impact with meaning. So let's get going. Welcome, Seven Hatters. In this episode, we speak with Wiley McGraw and dive deep into hats one, two, three, and four. The soul, the athlete, the servant, and the entrepreneur as we knock it out of the park and take the bull by the horns and discover the way towards true greatness. Wiley McGraw is no ordinary human being. He achieved massive success in multiple career paths ranging from professional baseball to professional bull riding to elite military combat service, to entrepreneur, and now Wiley works with top performers to help slay their demons. So if you're ready to battle your ego, let's put on our combat gear and welcome Wiley to the Seven Hats. Wiley, welcome to the Seven Hats. You've all, brother, thank you for having me, man. I'm looking forward to this. Uh, same here. You know, I'm so excited to speak with you today for the second time. <laughs> Talk about rolling with the punches. Our yeah. original yeah, interview, exactly. yeah, original interview was scheduled for last week, I think, and but we had terrible internet connection, and without any hesitation or without an ounce of friction, you were like, "Brother, let's try Monday and see what happens." You know, I love that because it's so easy to get people's stress level to rise from zero to ten in an instant. So. Here's the first lesson right. to the seven hatters who want to win, I think, and in the game of life, right? Roll with the punches. There's a freebie right there before we even start. Right there. <laughs> yep. It really is about embracing that when things don't turn out the way you expect them to in any given moment, despite how it feels, it's like just embrace that for a moment and realize this is not the circumstance that's going to dictate your, your life or your journey or your success. Roll with it and just have a conversation. Embrace what's going on. So I love it. I love it too. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So moving on, listening to you speak and reading your thoughts, you don't like to be referred to as a coach, but as a peak performance accelerator. And as a peak performance accelerator, you teach your clients to focus and work towards mastering all critical areas of their life. Mastery of self, relationships, health and wellness, career, you know, contribution to others, spirituality. And those are the same critical life areas that make up the seven hats. So that excites me. Yeah. And I imagine we will have lots to talk about. But before we get to learn all those golden nuggets that Wiley collected over the years, let's find out more about the mindset that shaped your desire to become a peak performer and in turn, help others do the same. Mm. So my first question to you, Wiley, where were you born and how was your childhood? <laughs> my my childhood was quite wild. <laughs> I was uh, you've all I, I was born in Southern California, oldest of three boys, and sports was an obsession in my household. My father was a semi pro ball player in the seventies, and as I I grew up uh, in that kind of environment at a young age, my dad recognized my talent. I had an arm. Apparently, I was three years old, and I picked up a ball and I threw it, and it was like that's that kid needs to be on a mound, you know. And wow. It was amazing because, uh, again, it was not like I had the choice to become a baseball player. I was forced into that world. And I don't get me wrong. I love it. I love being a leader on the teams that I played for, being a pitcher, uh, starting pitcher. Um, So we we practiced religiously day in and day out. My brothers did their sports, wrestling, football, track and field, soccer, et cetera. But my primary focus was baseball. 
And that was all I was expected to be. That perfectionism that came from my father's dire push to make me a pro, it was good in the beginning, right? And then I started to recognize as I got older, something's amiss. Something's going on here. I'm feeling like I need to separate myself from this. I started to find myself wandering mentally into different realms. I, you know, I was also writing poetry as a kid. I collected and traded baseball cards. Um, I was all about BMX writing and I felt like there was an imbalance at a young age. And I started to realize something's uniquely different about me because of the way in which even my brothers are treating me, my father treats me, how everybody comes to me with all of their stress and their issues. So it never allowed me to just be a baseball player. And as I got even older, that push, that desire to make me the best, to make me elite, fractured me mentally. That mindset started to change where I thought, this is not actually what I asked for. And I started to seek out something outside of my father's control, my family environment. And I started to go after some challenging, radical places that I felt I could just be more myself in the world of rodeo. I met people through through colleagues and friends in high school, and it just turned me on. It was seductive. It was exciting. It was dangerous. And I realized <laughs> this is where I wanted to be. I found myself feeling and connecting to emotions in ways I never had before, tapping into this power that I didn't know I possessed and meeting a side of me that I've been wanting to meet as a man. And I just got lost in that world and started riding bulls. I got turned on by it. And I remember that very first ride, that bull slipped in the mud and landed on my leg and we locked eyes and that stare changed me forever. And I realized this is what it actually feels like to be holistically me to be the, 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 I chose this. I'm I'm pursuing something that makes me excited. That turns me on. And then I started to reflect constantly every time I rode bowls and every time I went to a rodeo and I thought there's gotta be other environments out there that really challenge me even more than this. There's gotta be ways in which I can become a better human, a better person. What do I want to do next? And that's why I went after the United States military. And I joined the 101st airborne division and served three combat tours overseas. And then it was just in the throes of war that I really tapped back into understanding all those years ago that in a gift that I was born into this world with, I was unique and different. I possessed something that I didn't understand. And now I get while I was in the middle of combat. And it was that ability to truly erupt blind spots, people's stresses just in my presence and focus and connection to them. And then utilizing my leadership skills around what comes up to then redirect our focus, our intentions and our operational efforts for the ultimate levels of success in our performance. And I got excited by that, got out of the military, pursued self-mastery. And then I decided, you know what? I need to build something for myself around this holistic life that I've developed so that other people that are missing this component can live this way too. Because I saw a major flaw and blind spot in the personal development space that nobody was talking about. Everybody was in concept of it, but I was watching how leaders and and public figures and, and all these other people were saying one thing, but their lives were in turmoil over here. And I was like, I, I want to end that. So I'm, I've been on a crusade for the last 14 years to do this radical work, slaying the demons of powerful people because of my life experiences that didn't make me or break me. They just introduced me to a version of myself that I've been waiting to meet so that I can turn around and impart that wisdom and impart those experiences for these powerful people to do the same and connect all, like you say, the seven hats into true holistic optimization. So they're no longer battling demons and they're living their life from their fullest place of of peace and freedom while they're infecting and influencing those around them. Wow. I love that. It's you're literally peeling the onion as you were learning (laughs) the core principles that allow you to play the game of life because the game of life is inherently extremely, extremely difficult and challenging for anyone. If you are lucky enough to be the one sperm and the one egg that just connect and you're, you materialize on this planet. I don't care who you are. You're going to have a challenging life. The question is, are you going to go through what you went through to figure it out and help others? Or are you going to be the victim of your circumstance? So we're definitely going to get there, but I want to go back. You're born to a semi-pro baseball player, right? Obviously you wanted to make your dad proud. Sure. I'm Assuming that your dad lived vicariously through you, right? Is yes. that is that correct? Yeah. And so my first question is, do you really think that you loved the game or did you really want to just please your dad? That's, that's easily answered. And I appreciate you asking that is, I don't think I, I loved the game from what I understood of the game being born into that. 
I realized as I stepped into the world of rodeo, that is not really where I wanted to go, despite what I could have created. And I don't get me wrong, people are like, why didn't you stay in it? You could have been a pro. Of course I could have. I was never enticed by money. And it, even as a young kid, I was trading baseball cards. I was always just this balanced, fair kid. I was taking care of my friends. We're having a good time. It was all about having these experiences with people so we all can win. And win in a way that makes sense for each one of us. So for me, you're right. I, I don't think I truly loved it from a position of born and bred to be a star baseball player and be a pro athlete. Even though I had the talent, it was just, I was playing for the expectations of those around me, which that was the external pressure that overwhelmed the natural stresses and pressures that come along with being an athlete, which created that contrast for me to identify something's different here in my life and I don't like it. And I need to shift my focus my mindset and my pursuit to a different place so I can experience what it is I'm meant to experience in this world. Because, and I'll finish this with this specific thing, you've all is I was always the place in my family dynamic or friend growing up where everybody turned and brought all of their, the way they erupted around me, the chaos they experienced. I was the place where I, I was essentially the janitor. So mm. As I discovered and understood that when I got into, into the combat zone in the military, I realized, wow, okay, I have something I'm possessed. Let me cultivate this and utilize it to my advantage to help optimize other people who are stuck in the, the rut of systems and programs and compartmentalized thinking, but want to live an ultimate uh, optimal high profile, high performance life so they can influence and impact others the way they want to as well. And that's why this whole path led me down that route. Yeah, there's a lot of dynamics. I mean, I think for most of us, uh, especially I think guys, the father always wants to either live vicariously or wants to indoctrinate the son into what they're yeah. doing, right? And my dad, my dad is a violin maker. When I was young, he wanted me, me to be a violin player and then a violin maker. And it took years and years and years of me just pushing back until he finally accepted the fact that I wouldn't be his star performer. Right. He did convince my sister for a few years before she became a doctor <laughs> that she should be a violin maker. That's a oh, whole okay. other story. All right. So you mentioned that the stress and pressures were greater off the field, leading you to seek out some coping mechanisms. I believe you said it was alcohol, cigarettes, fist fighting. I mean, you were rebelling, right? What right. was your mindset during that time? And what did you learn about yourself and your relationship with your dad Especially when you told your dad, dad, I'm not playing ball anymore. What happened? Uh, I'll make this short and concise. I never had that conversation with him. Really? Uh, I, I, I took off and did what I knew was going to be best for me. And um, that's one of the things I want people to, that are hearing this right now to understand is like sometimes the confrontation is necessary, absolutely necessary. And one of my philosophies is, um, and this is how I operate with my, the leaders and powerful people I work with, is truly confrontation. You only know someone when you fight them. That's when you reveal the true character of who they are is when they're in those moments of stress, you're getting to, to the core of their truth. You, you're not getting the, the facade that they present. But with my father, it was I started to do things I wanted to do that fulfilled me. And it automatically, as a byproduct, created the separation and the break. And I decided to just go full force into the direction that felt right, despite whatever reactions or feelings that these people were going to have, because I knew despite how scary that might've been as, as a young age, uh, having that confrontation with your, your father and mother, et cetera, because it can be un very uncomfortable when you have that as a young person. I didn't care. What drove me more was to understand who I was, to really discover what I was capable of. What am I meant to do in this world? Because it doesn't feel right here. And I'm not willing to embrace the coping mechanisms that I embrace, like getting into altercations with other cowboys and other people in school, because I was basically trying to transfer the energy that I was carrying around inside me from those unfavorable circumstances in my, my upbringing onto others who were just feeling my presence. Like I shared a minute ago is these people would feel these men at school, et cetera, wanted to challenge me. And that was normal. It was part of this, what I carried and possessed. They were just, they didn't know what they were experiencing, but I was thought this is a great place for me to relieve stress. And I utilize, you know, I, I got into drinking a little bit of beer and whiskey, you know, at a young age, especially being in a rodeo. It was like the thing. But I found that I was not doing right by myself this way. And I do not want to live my life coping with stress like everybody else teaches us that we should do. For me, I want to find resolution. I want to find ways to eradicate. And that's why 
I broke away from that world, got into the rodeo, but then the rodeo wasn't enough. And I wanted to pursue other challenging environments that really took me to another level, which is why the military was the ultimate place for me really to discover my own innate leadership, the gifts I carried, and what it actually takes to be a real leader to optimize and uplift others around you through how well I'm living my life, not just what I say or know. So by you not addressing it, did it strain your relationship? We, we strain. You can say that. I, I, I can say that it, it wasn't, I, I didn't do what I was expected to do. So of course, it's not going to, it's not going to go down in the history books as being uh, the most optimal of dynamics. And I'm okay with that, you know, and at the end of the day, again, it's, I'm not willing to sacrifice my standards despite who it is and despite what I might have to give up. I was, I'm willing to give up whatever it takes to uphold and, and live by the standards that I know are the best for my life and what it is that I'm looking to do out in the world. Got it. So I have a philosophical question for you. Okay. You're done with baseball. Now you get unleashed by becoming a pro bull rider. So here's a question. Since we all love to learn the lessons that you gained during the per- this period of your life, let's for a moment pretend that the bull represents life. Mm-hmm. You're on the bull. Mm-hmm. You just strapped yourself in. Mm-hmm. The clock goes three, two, One, what are the lessons that you've learned as the shoot gate swings open? I love it. First and foremost, I think it's important to say this is I had absolute control over when that shoot gate opened up. Lesson number one, I felt every time I slid down on the back of a 1500 pound, 2000 pound animal, I felt this wild life underneath me. It's surreal connecting to you, shifting in in the gates, this confined space. And every emotion you can feel, I felt all at once. Every thought ran through my head all at once. And all that I could remember each time was absolute presence and focus, allowing those things to be with me, realizing that when I'm ready at any given moment, I have absolute control over opening that gate to then go experience that ride. I have no idea what that ride's going to do or how it's going to go. But what got exciting every time was the fact that I was in control of the challenge that was presenting itself before me. And every time I felt that moment of deep breath, I'm ready. I just called it. I never hesitated. I never let fear come up and tell me, hold off a little longer. Wait, maybe this isn't right for you. Anytime I started to experience fear when it was time, I stepped towards it anyway and called the gate. And when that gate opened up, everything in life goes quiet. That eight seconds, if you're lucky to cover a bull was what we call it feels like an eternity. All that matters is you are absolutely present. You're grounded and centered and you know exactly what will happen because you trust your training, you trust your gut, you trust your intuition, and you just stay connected to the bowl. And the the outcome itself shows up for you because you're not worried about what the outcome is going to be. You're not worried about the fear or the potential harm that could come from it being thrown off, stepped on, which I have been multiple times. It didn't matter. And that's the thing, I, the lesson I learned from every time I rode was I'm in control of where I face myself, what challenges I embrace, and I'm in control of only myself in those challenges. And if I let go of trying to control the challenge itself, which is what a lot of leaders do today, they try to control their resources. People only hire coaches that they can somewhat you know, handle or manage. When you shift that mindset to unconditional vulnerability, letting go of control of the challenge and only realizing you have control over your reactions to those challenges, it will do things for you in ways you have never experienced. And that's the biggest lesson I took away from bull riding. I love that. So just to summarize, you were in control of your actions and you were in control of how you dealt with your circumstances, but you were not in control of the bull. And you didn't even want to be in control of the bull because you couldn't be control of the bull. And I think that's what entrepreneurs really need to hone in on. They try to control the bull. They try to control life. And then they get kicked in the face. Constantly. 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 And that's the thing is I learned with some of the pro rodeo mentors I had around me. um, One of the things when we were practicing on barrels that we have, when we practice like these, they tie these barrels with these ropes and they, they teach you as they make you buck on these things. And they would tell me just like in the Kung Fu and martial arts that I practice is learn how to yield and surrender, learn how to actually embrace 
you know, the ability to let go while still maintaining some, some positive um, uh, groundedness to what you're doing. They said, the moment you let go of the bowl, the better you're going to ride because you've got the skill and the training. And the more I would surrender that idea and I would let the ego go stop. And I let my just I completely get give into the intimate connection with the animal. Man, it, I'm telling you, I rode so much better. I had so much more fun. I actually covered more bowls. I won little jackpots here and there. And I realized that in itself is going to be the only way I'm going to move forward in life. And you were loving it, right? Life was oh, it's so exciting. It was so exciting. Yeah. And so why did you end your bull riding career? And why did you decide to become a combat infantry leader? You know, and, and then again, what did you learn during your time in the military? Well, I joined the military while I was still riding bulls. And uh, what the beautiful thing was being in the military, you have opportunities to have leave, time off. And every time I had time off, that's where I went. I was always traveling around different parts of, you know, the South, et cetera, finding jackpot rodeos to enter in and being part with my friends still back in, in California. And uh, I would go home on leave. I'd go ride where I used to ride. So that didn't really go away. It wasn't like a, a stark stop going to the military. But I realized the day that I, um, I entered a jackpot on leave and I remember uh, feeling something different that I had not felt before. Some so real fear was there. And I said, there's something's funky here. And I didn't listen to that gut feeling. Mm. And I still got in the back of that animal. And when I slid down in the back of that animal, I looked at it and it, I mean, this was, this was a monster. And I, and I felt, I felt a, something like an uneasy earthquake inside. I was like, there's, this doesn't feel right. There, I, and, but yet given a little bit of the ego, given a little bit of like, I really love what I'm doing here. I still called my gate. And when they opened it up within about two seconds, he, I thought he was going left. He went back to the right and he, he spider like cartwheel whipped me to the ground and it, it fractured my lower back. Mm. And when I hit the ground and I started crawling away to jump over that, that fence and I laid uh, across the grass and my buddies were holding me and trying to get ice packs, I realized I didn't listen to my intuition, my gut, the real version of myself that was telling me it's okay to pull out of here. I got injured for it. I'm never going to do that again. That is me battling up against despite what it is I'm looking to get done in that moment, that was me battling up against a part of me that was telling me this, you're done. You don't need to do this anymore. And the universe forced me in that moment getting hurt because I'm a big energy. So I got to get hurt to actually learn the lesson. Slam me on the ground, goes, wake up. You don't need to do this anymore. It's time for you to move on. And that's why I shifted away from bull riding, focused on just my military service and then where I wanted to go from there. If you had an injury, how... Did that affect your military service? How do how were you able to to go to combat? Well, so that's, that's a beautiful thing about being in the military. And I was on I was on leave on vacation. I had doctors and resources at my disposal, given the fact that I was in combat arms with one of the most elite units in the world. Um, so I was I just told me hey, I got hurt doing this thing. It was just a you know a small fracture on one of the vertebrae. So it's not like it destroyed me to a degree where I couldn't perform my duties. We rehab quickly, and then of course September 11th happened not too long later, and I was off my on my way to Afghanistan. So. Um, again, it was all about just embracing the fact that I didn't listen. I got hurt. Now I'm going to focus solely on optimizing my health, recovery, et cetera, because I do care, focus, and want to be the best soldier I can be, especially when I was starting to take over my squad. I needed to be the best leader as possible. So that's why I was able to heal so quickly because it was the mindset aspect of focusing on what matters most. By the way, thank you for your service. Really appreciate it. Brother. Thank you. What life lessons did you learn in the military? The military taught me <clears throat> quickly how to be calm in the midst of chaos. That, that to me sticks and has stuck with me every single day since I left the military uh, nearly 20 years ago. And it's, it's, it's part of my leadership development that I realized circumstances that are happening around us are reflective of, what's, of the wars that are going on within us. And for me was finding places of peace within while I served the military accentuated my leadership style and ultimately provided me more, more strategy to, to deal with and handle chaotic moments. Now, the training, of course, kicks in when you're in chaotic moments. So you just become calm and very focused. That's what we are in the military. That's what we're trained to do. If you consider boot camp and specialty schools, like in the army, we have, you know, we go to boot camp and we go to specialty school, ranger school, et cetera. We learn throughout these experiences how to truly optimize our ability to stay focused and remain calm in the midst of chaos. And that is the biggest lesson I took away was where are people lacking in their lives when it comes to their ultimate level of growth? And it is, can they remain calm despite circumstances? 
Do they know how to discern when a circumstance is dangerous or uh, or not dangerous? Um, and can they stay focused despite what's going on around them? That's key to ultimate success for a human being. How long were you in the military? How many years? Uh, six years, active duty, three years tours, three tours overseas, excuse me. So I interviewed a Navy SEAL and he told me that the most difficult aspect of his service was becoming a civilian after the fact. He was so used to the way right. the military performs day in and day out. And he found himself lost. Did, did you find yourself lost? I wouldn't even, I wouldn't say lost because we all have our own unique experiences. I, he, I understand what he's saying because I worked with some Navy SEALs when I first got out of the, uh, when I first started my business, I was working with a lot of veterans dealing with this transition back into the civilian world, dealing with PTSD, wanting to get off medications, et cetera. And um, some of the SEALs I know I skydive now, so I jump with some Navy SEALs and we constantly talk about these laugh aspects of our experiences in the military. But it is when you are used to combat and you're used to your job being that solely, it is difficult to transition the internal clock, the dynamic that you are into a place where there is no real chaos, so to, so to speak, even though what ends up happening is when I got in the military, I started to experience and face the wars that were not resolved back home. And most military guys will tell you when they actually get that kind of awareness that what they're really saying to you is, I liked the peace of being in war more than I like the chaos of calm back home. Because in reality, we live daily back home with a lot of our own battles in family dynamics, in society as a whole, because our leaders are not done right. They're not living their best lives, so they're infecting everyone. So people are coming back from combat going, how do I integrate into this? Because I can't kill the enemy. I can't hurt these people. I can't do what I typically do over here. And that is where that contrast, that conflict starts to mess with them. So for me, it was more along the lines of, what do I need to do to manage and then battle these wars that I have not been able to address back home so that I can integrate better into life again? And that's why I went down that path of self-mastery and why these people are looking for ways to make themselves transition much more fluidly and much more uh, effortlessly. And that's the key to it is really going, let me face these wars at home now. Let me battle them the right way so that I can actually smoothly get back to where I belong. After your call of duty, mm -hmm. you decided to become an entrepreneur. God bless your soul. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> if 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 bull riding and and uh, and the military is not going to kick your ass, entrepreneurship definitely will. So you were focused. I mean, the three journeys in your life, or the or the the aspects of your life from being a ball player to bull riding to military, mm -hmm. those are all very achievement oriented, results oriented professions, right? Did you find that to be the case? And then when you became an entrepreneur. Why did you switch from the mindset of results to a holistic approach or having to train others who are achievement oriented to a holistic human? Yeah, I don't. Um, I know this might sound, you know what, it might come across to other people like, wow, wait a minute. Did he just say what I thought he said? And I'm going to say it anyway, because that's what I care about is I never did those things to achieve anything. Hmm. I just never had the mindset of, I got to go achieve. I've got to go figure out how to achieve more here. I was always driven by the experience. I was always driven by the freedom that these environments provided me as a person. And like I shared earlier was when I got into, out of the military, this path of self-mastery, learning about me and wanting to know more about what my gifts were, my skill sets, what I'm capable of doing in the world. I started to realize that flaw that people have been taught and fooled into believing that success in life means achievement. It means making money, getting notoriety, scaling a business, um, doing things uh, that should be considered byproducts of who you are and how well you live your life. Now, it's amazing human beings have the ability to become billionaires despite battling their demons they have not looked at you know, yeah. their entire lives. But for me, it was never a transition from achievement to then holistic. It was an innate part of me knew I was different and unique. I was brought into this world out of my mother's womb as this 
warrior that at first my dad was not allowing to be present in baseball, forcing me to be this version that he wanted me, me to be, where bull riding allowed me to meet that warrior. That warrior said, this is where I belong. I'm going to go find more radical and challenging environments to accentuate him. And then I look back and I go, and I want everybody to hear this, is your life experiences, your messes are not who you are and they are not your message. They should be seen as just that experiences you went through and then what did you do to resolve those experiences that impacted you and what me messaging can you take from that resolution and utilize to then do what you care about doing out in the world and this is the unfortunate part is most people actually don't care to do that they want to find ways to circumvent hack and build monetary wealth thinking that if they do that first, then they can turn around and buy themselves internal peace, buy themselves happiness, buy themselves notoriety, buy themselves relationships. And this is why we have people that are constantly living in suffering and silence and never fully knowing who they really are. And they're just living and operating and creating the limitations. So for me, it was just as I experienced these things, as I met people over my life, I realized it is truly about going here first inward battling myself, facing my truth, becoming the man I want to be, knowing who I am without stress, chaos, or sacrifice, and then turning myself around and then creating something that provides other people the right atmospheres and environments to make them the most elite version of themselves. So it's not even training as I'm truly integrating into the lives of the people I work with, providing them the environments, the challenges in real time. I live, the travel, and, and spend 24 hours, seven days a week with the people that I work with and support because I'm on this crusade to slay these demons, to make them these holistic optimized versions of themselves because their influence and their impact will in fact naturally heal the masses. That's why I do what I do. That's what I understood through those experiences that I was built to do. And that's why I pursued this optimized holistic approach to human performance. I mean, you're going deep in and looking at the core problem, right, the core issue that creates all the symptoms in our lives. And I think that what's interesting is how you were able to figure that out. And you're a young guy, so early on in your career, where so many have a problem because they're just trying to fix the symptom. And they keep on solving for the symptom, never fixing the core problem and yeah. then they wonder why their life is a mess. How did you figure that out in, so early? You're just saying you were born with it? Yeah, I was born with it, but I didn't uncover what it really was until I got into the military and I got put in the most, I mean, you go to combat, that you want to talk about the ultimate suck fest, go to war. That's, that's the true place. And in those moments, I started to put the pieces together that this is all the experiences I had made sense now for why I'm built a certain way, a different way than most people. And that, and that is what I, I need to understand more of. And then utilize that and build. I built my business around that. It's like everything that I do is this crusade. It's not about my bottom line. I'm not out. I'm coming out of the shadows after 13 years, not because I want to grow and scale. It's because there are leaders there, even if that's that one person out there that doesn't know I exist, but knows they need this type of integrated, inside out, true human performance acceleration then they, then I, at least I know that I've done my job and I've come out to this world to complete my mission. So it's really an innate part of me that I discovered through those experiences. And then I cultivated over the years and now I just own and command and I put it out into the world to signal to these leaders, Hey, look, stop living this life that's compartmentalized where you are sacrificing your relationships and your health. You're sacrificing your mindset and your focus. You're sacrificing your emotions you're chalking everything up to being outside of you and realize the only way you're going to get to your ultimate level of success and truly live optimized sustainably is if you turn inward and you face your demons, you battle them head on with the right resource that can get into the trenches with you that you can like the bowl, you cannot control so you can actually experience that ride that you've been looking for your entire life. Wow. I love that because I've always you know, thought that Life is a reflection of who you are inside. So if you look at it, if you think about a projector, a movie projector, and it's projecting onto the screen, it's projecting what's inside, you know, that film. And most people go out and try, like if there's lint on the lens, they try to clean the lint off of the screen rather than the lens. Yeah. And so, and so what mm -hmm. you just said is very, very poignant because 
ultimately it's not about the outside. It's the inside that creates the outside. And if you try to fix the outside, you'll never fix the problem because the problem is within. Right. And I'll give you a, one more example. I had this short conversation with this billionaire not too long ago where, and this is the mindset of these people at the top. They, they believe that their problems are outside of themselves. They, they try to find solutions from the, their resources, coaches and consultants that, that come in and, and utilize their own education and their own skills and their own um, you know, strategies to, to fix the problem. When in fact, most difficulties people face don't reside within the problem themselves. They, they're elsewhere. But if you don't have anybody who knows how to see those things, if you're not actually willing to get into someone's life with them, which most people unfortunately are not, then you're never really going to see the truth about what's actually plaguing that person causing this problem to show up. And if we can get to that solution first, we can go inside out, fully integrated into someone's life and truly get them to experience and stop being afraid of themselves, they'll notice how their difficulties resolve much more effortlessly. And then the problems kind of just go away and they get to know what it's like to have a more seamless growth in the companies they run or the lives that they live. Yeah. In, in, in my theory, I think billionaires have it the worst because they can buy their way out of a lot of right. problems and not have to address it. But the problem is, as Oprah said, the universe is going to throw a couple of pebbles your way. And if you don't pay attention, that boulder is coming right <laughs> around the corner. It's going to hit you square in the head and no m amount of money that you have will be able to fix it, which is why you have billionaires who are in antidepressants while everybody thinks that the money or the achievement or whatever it might be solves all your problems. You know, I, I tell my wife all the time, if you can't be peaceful, if you can't be happy, if you can't find contentment, if you can't, when you're poor, when you don't have anything, you'll never find it when you're rich or have achievement because ultimately it, it it's like alcohol. It accentuates everything that's inside. So if you're angry when you're poor, you're going right. to be angry when you're rich. I, probably right. worse off, right? <laughs> right, right. So you became an entrepreneur. Yeah. What were the initial challenges that you faced building your business? I mean, there's, I've never heard of an entrepreneur that just starts the business. Everything's flowing. They get customers, clients. Everything is just hunky-dory. What were some of your challenges? How did you overcome them? How was your experience with your previous roles? How did that help you navigate and, and create a great company, which is what you have right now? Yes. And, I, and I'm glad that you're asking that because... Again, of course, my unique set of circumstances are going to be different from everybody else's. But what's what's amazing was I remember I was getting ready to be a firefighter. And my amazing business partner, she's like, you, and again, this is where I was trying to discover what do I want to do in the world? How do I want to help people? And firefighting to me was like, you know what? That is like the last respectable profession out in the world. And I really want to go participate in taking care of people that way. Because to me, that's selfless. And I, I'm all about healing and helping people that way. And, and we got into this conversation when I, when I met her a long time ago, 14 plus years ago, she's like, no, you are, you possess something that's meant to do this type of work. And it was like a light went on and I went, oh my gosh, that's exactly what I've been thinking about in a different way. And she presented that to me in such a, an unbelievable grounded factual basis where her intuition was like, nope, here's where you're going to go. Here's your capacity, what you're meant to do. And it was almost like, a week later, I met a veteran who goes, I want to work with you. Co coach me, do something with me. I want to know what it takes to be confident like you. And how do I carry myself? And how do I deal with myself? And he felt something between us. And that's where the business took off. Now, the, the, the trials and tribulations that come along with that is I want to be able to get my work out to the right people. I don't want to just do it to make money for money's sake. I want to work with people who want this type of work. And it naturally became where I was putting myself in the most uncomfortable positions, speaking events, you know, going to like standing in front of different places with veterans affairs, et cetera, and just introducing myself and having conversations. And to me, that was an ultimate challenge because I didn't know what to say. I didn't know how to tell people, you know, hey, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a demon slayer. I'm here to heal people and transform their lives. Like I didn't know where I was going to go with my wording. To me, it was just like, I'm just going to put myself in these environments and I'm going to shake people's hands and I'm going to let them feel me. And that was, I think, the biggest challenge for me becoming an entrepreneur because it's not like that was innate. I didn't have anybody teach me about entrepreneurship. I had to discover it with my partner, et cetera. And I realized 
it's only if I just step towards the things that scare me the most is where my success is going to grow. And by doing so, I started getting invited to like, you know, speaking events uh, for Veterans Affairs with US Congress people. I started to, I got interviews on NPR, NBC on different segments around uh, Veterans Resource Centers for Colleges in California. I went to a speaking panel where I actually uh, keynoted the the opening up of 56 Veterans Resource Centers across the state to help vets come home and transition back in. And I realized, Every time I put myself in this environment and I say yes to this thing that scares the crap out of me, that's where my entrepreneurial vision can grow. And it started to, to grow and accelerate that way where the veterans I was working with said, I want you to meet my doctor. I want you to meet my lawyer. I want my friends who are professional baseball players. And that's where I became this word of mouth behind the scenes, pass along resource. And it was only when I would put myself in the most arduous positions that I experienced real success in my growth. When I started to feel myself pull away from that, that's when things kind of got a little funky. And I realized, I was like, oh my God, I just got to get on that bowl again, man. And I got to just call the gate regardless. And if I get a little banged up, so be it. But damn it, I'm, I'm on a mission and I need to focus on what I want to see created out in the world. And that's why I was able to move through those trials and tribulations in a more efficient way, streamlined way. So as you're starting to help people, I know a lot of entrepreneurs face <laughs> this. Ever have uh, imposter syndrome? Imposter syndrome, I, I've discovered, comes from when, when you have someone tell you to fake it till you make it. I, I think that's garbage advice. Um, absolutely. If you have to tell someone to fake it to make it, you don't care about them. You mm -hmm. care about their payment. So at the end of the day, it's kind of like, if you need to fake it till you make it, you and I can talk about this probably for hours, where what you're doing is you're basically codifying, solidifying that essence of yourself, which is a false version of you. You're saying that this is who I am, and I'm going to continue to fake who I am until I feel like I've made some headway in my success. Then you're never really going to understand who you actually are. And then that's where imposter syndrome can be birthed from, where you start to question, like, is this really me? Do I really have value? Do I really care about what I'm doing? Do people actually listen to what I have to say? And this is what I found in my experience working behind the scenes with very prominent people is in fact, they have faked it often in their lives to make it to where they are. Looking back 20 years later, 30 years later, going, dude, I am burned out at my wit's end. My life sucks. I have $100 million in my bank, but I, what am I doing? I'm miserable. Why did I do all of that at the, at the expense of my health and my, my, my sanity? And that's what happens. So no, I, I don't think I ever experienced imposter syndrome, but as we all do, I did at times because it's coming from me like it comes from you and everyone else, we kind of go, what I say, does that, does, that, does that sound valuable to someone? Even though it is, you know it is, but when you hear it, you're like, yeah, I talk about that all the time, but is someone else going to actually experience it the way that I experience it and pull value from it? But then you kind of go, you know what? I trust myself. I like it. Yes. Those are the only times I have those moments where I self-reflect and go, did I just provide excellent value to Yuval and his audience right now? Hell yeah, I did. If he has a problem with it, he probably is going to tell me and that's okay with it too. you know. And I just allow myself to go through that feeling. Yeah. I mean, what I love about you is mm -hmm. your authenticity, the fact that you are a genuine individual who wants to help others. I'm not going to call you coach I, with all my, <laughs> with all, with all my mighty force, I'm going to not call you coach, but mm -hmm. you know, and it's funny because I think like you said, and what resonated was one of the, one of our conversations you, you mentioned on how destructive coaches are on the internet, especially lately, last five to seven years since Facebook and Instagram, you know, we, sc we scroll through the Facebook feed and Instagram feeds, and it seems like every other ad is a coach trying to sell success in some magic pill. And they right. say, you know, take this pill and you're guaranteed to live my glorious life as, as they walk sure. around their rented Ferrari and mansion, you know, that they spent three grand for. Meanwhile, they're living yeah. with their grandma, you know, what's... <laughs> You know, and that's the whole thing about this outside in mentality and approach. Yeah. I love what you're selling because it's honest and it's different because ultimately it's you, what you're saying is you got to do the hard work. You got to put yourself in a position where you're going to suffer and you're going to challenge yourself mm. because if you don't challenge yourself, you're never going to break through. Because if I just tell you what to do and you do A, B and C, yes, the 1% or 5% of individuals, they strike luck. And, and it happens that what the person is selling, they get, right? But the 99% yeah. or 95% fail every single time, but they just gave their money away to that coach who is now profiting from it. So brother, I love, I love that. You know? Thank you. And I, and I love that you said that. And I want to add to that real quick. It is unfortunate because 
everybody is in it, in it for the, most of the people are in it for themselves. Like we talked about earlier, it's like, how do I make the most amount of money? And then, you know, we're, we're constantly convinced that if I just follow what this person did, it's that what I like to call is the uh, learning copy method. And I wrote about it in this paper, you know, um, it, it's all about getting helped versus being optimized and realizing that at the end of the day, I'm not here to sell anybody anything. I'm here to provide people the connection and the intimacy. And if they feel it and they lean into it, then we can explore a relationship. And then we can explore for the calibration, whether or not you're even ready to do this kind of work. Because what matters to me is only working with a type of people that are looking to live what it is they say that they're, li- that they're all about, not just talk about it like these coaches, et cetera, where they're selling flashy cars and private jets and you know this money, but truly being about it. It's really walking that, walking that walk, not just talking the talk. And it's like, I was on a show recently, uh, 365 Driven with Tony Watley, great guy, talked about the same thing. And he's like, look, man, I'm tired of coaches too. Everybody thinks that they have the next best thing to make people great and elite. And at the end of the day, it's more limitation. It's yeah. more transferring someone's motivational spirit into someone else to get them high on the idea of concept. And then they go home and there's nobody in their life with them to hold their feet to the fire to apply it the right yeah. way. And then... If you want to follow steps A, B, and C, it's going to have value. It will. And I'm not going to knock things out there that don't create some results. But what about all those nuanced spaces in between step A, step B, step C that you're not seeing, that you're missing? What about your capacity to perform? Is your capacity stretched far enough to handle spending $100,000 to work with an ex-influencer? Probably not. So why don't you look at the capacity aspect of who you are and approach it from there first, and then turn around and realize it's not about transferring motivational spirit. It's about transformation. And transformation is ugly. It's destructive, and it happens in the dark corners. And until you experience that, you're actually not outside your comfort zone. Your proverbial comfort zone is just the thing your ego is telling you you're feeling, and you're not really outside of it. When you're outside of it, you're going to know because you're going to be scared. You're going to feel out of control, and you're going to feel uncertainty, and you're going to realize, oh my gosh, this is where the rubber meets the road, and this is where I need to either embrace it, or I can turn tail and run. Let's talk about stress, shall we? Yeah, please. I've been around for a few decades now. (laughs) (laughs) Too many that I'd like to admit to. And I don't recall ever seeing such a rise in collective human stress. You Mm. know, the last two to three years were brutal to so many. And of course, you know, with this much bad news raining upon us, you know, as we listen to the news, scroll through the social feeds, speak with our friends and family, Mm. you know, in your own words, one, what is the definition of stress? So I'd like to hear what you think of it. And, and two, you mentioned that there are two types of stress. And finally, what's your take on the past two to three years and what you've seen out there with your clients? First answer to your question, what, what, is, the defin- what is my definition of, a, of stress? Well, you got to identify, go into the second part of that question is you got to identify the different types of stress that we live with. Understanding that We have what is normal stress of being alive, being human. Life is its own unique set of circumstances and challenges that we navigate. There are going to be normal stresses you cannot eliminate. Being an entrepreneur is one of them. Running a business, there's stress. (laughs) Dealing with with teams and marketing people and PR, it's like, oh, you got a lot on your plate. That's a stress. Understanding how to manage and utilize that stress is key to success as an entrepreneur or business or whatever you do. People don't have that discernment. They don't really know how to manage and understand it so they can utilize it as an asset. They just allow it to be a detriment, which is why we have industries that are built to cope. Alcohol, porn, right? It's sports, entertainment. It's all about escapism. Had a hard day? Go drink a bottle of whiskey. You'll get over it for the day. And unfortunately, like you said earlier, it's like a band-aid on a bowl of whole approach that billions of dollars are spent into. Same thing with the personal development space. Unfortunately, it does the same thing. That stress is normal. Learn how to manage it. Learn what it means for you when you're experiencing it and embrace it. The other types of stress that I talk about that are actually not good for us whatsoever that we can eradicate are what I call acute stress and chronic stress. A chronic stress is the impact from negative life experiences that create these undetectable patterns of doubt, fear, and cautiousness cautiousness at a subconscious level that fester within you. And the more you step towards scary, challenging things that are meant to grow you, the more those things are going to bubble up and create what I call acute stresses. Mm -hmm. Those acute stresses are life experiences that seem to keep happening to you over and over again, or the problems you keep reoccurring, despite what they might look like, that you can't quite put your finger on. You're like, why does this keep showing up? 
why do I keep having the same experience with X person in my business? And I'll give you a quick example as I had, I worked with the CEO in a, in a small tech company. They were about $50 million a year and they had a private equity firm that wanted to, to, they bought them and wanted to sell them for a quarter billion dollars. And they brought in the CEO and said, Hey, here's your job. I need you to build a C-suite team. We need you to get this company sold within the next three to five years for $250 million. There's a $14 million bonus checking you for you if you do it. And he literally built out his team, some old guards, some new people. But the last person that he needed to get the ship off the ground was a COO. Couldn't keep three candidates. The most random things were showing up for him. One little gal who was totally in, she says, I'm in, completed, stopped talking to him, didn't show up and disappeared. Okay. Another person came in and botched the interview on, like, and told him, I botched it on purpose because I really don't feel like this is going to be the right place for me. Wow. And another person basically like messed up three different appointments. They couldn't even figure out how to get her on the schedule. He's like, why is this happening to me? And the work that we did together without going into the details, because again, it's, it's so much more nuanced and complicated than just giving a surface level challenge. But what we identified was, he had been sweeping under the rug his whole life, this really dysfunctional aspect of his relationship with his father, who basically told him he would never mount to anything. Okay. Carrying all of that chronic stress in his life, he never faced his dad. He never battled that through. He just stuffed it down as a man. I'm good to go. Made some good money. I'm a CEO now. I can do all this stuff, but couldn't figure out why this was not working. And when we finally got him to a place of ultimate vulnerability in the work we did together, and we started to battle that together head on and eradicate and made him do the most un unconventional things to face that demon, it was amazing how the right person just showed up two days later, literally. I don't know. He's like, where did you come from? I'm like, I don't know. I just found this you know, through, my, through the grapevine. I thought maybe I'd reach out and see if he needed a CEO. And he was like, absolutely. Brought that person on. And despite all we continue to do to keep him optimal in his work as a CEO, he was able to sell that company. I think they did like sold it for like 200 million or whatever it was. They didn't really hit their mark, but three years from 50 to 200 was a huge feat for him. Yeah. And it was amazing how even his relationship with his girlfriend, he ended up marrying and improved, how his health started to change, his mindset shifted as a leader. And he realized all this time, all my career, that chronic stress that resided within me was causing me to experience this in everything that I did. Every time I would get ready to, to, to excel, something would show up that would stop me in my tracks. And I always tried to override that. I always try to circumvent it. So when I want your audience to hear with that is that chronic stress that you are not facing and confronting head on is in fact creating many of the, the difficulties and experiences that you have that are not conducive to your success as an entrepreneur or business owner. If you do not turn around and battle that chronic stress and resolve it, pull out the roots of that weed permanently, you're going to consistently experience acute stress. Which goes to the third part, you've all, which is great, is over the last three years, four, five years, and I've experienced this in my entire career of almost 14 years, being behind the scenes with these people, is they believe, again, everything is outside of them, that people bring the stress into their environment and cause them to stress out. They believe that everything is outside of them, everything's compartmentalized. They don't consider where in their life are they not looking at that's causing X to happen in their companies and they don't know what to do about it. And what I've witnessed over the last three to five years, unfortunately, is this massive flaw in leadership that continuously allows ego to separate them from their responsibilities to the impact that they have on those that are around them. Because how well you live your life directly affects those that you influence and those that you that de depend on you that you uh, are in charge of. And leaders are refusing to accept that reality and that truth, which is what's creating more division, more, more uh, fracturing in our society. And to me, that's, that's unacceptable at the highest order and why I'm out here now after all these years doing what I'm doing. Wow. I'm almost wondering on a spiritual level, if the last few years are just a culmination of the human population worldwide, right? Becoming too attached to their ego, too opportunistic, not addressing core issues that they're sweeping under the rug. And it was last thought, if I can, it's like yeah. Bill Burr, that comedian even talked about, he does this series and he said, nobody is, everybody out here is no longer in a team oriented dynamic in society. It's all individualism. Everybody's out for themselves. Yeah. And that starts with leadership. End of story, full stop. If leaders are broken, society's broken. If we do yeah. not get them to be optimal, our society is going to continue down this bad rabbit hole and we're going to break ourselves. Yeah. End of story. Yeah.
Absolutely. All right. Uh, one question before my, my final one, my last one. So, sure, sure, sure. all right. Uh, and, it, and it still has to do with stress because you said something that I thought was really interesting. And I want to ask you about that one and actually challenge you on it. I think you said that you believe stress could or should be reduced as you're climbing up the ladder of success. Yeah. Yep. Can you elaborate on, on why? Because to most people, mm -hmm. The opposite is true, right? As they climb the ladder, they have yep. more pressure, uh, more yep. responsibilities, you know, which obviously creates more stress in life. And, right. you know, we think of presidents, kinds of industry, people like Elon Musk, Jeff Bezos. To me, they look stressed out of their minds. So sure. what are they doing wrong? And why do you believe that stress should be reduced as you become more powerful? So recall that I said there's a difference between the normal stresses that come along with your capacity and your positions. So when you consider a president in the United States, he's taken uh, uh, the helm of 400 million people. That's that. Those are going to be normal stresses and pressures that come along with the response, myriad of responsibilities that are on his plate. It's about having the right resources, advisors that are, are supporting someone at that level to manage, utilize, and optimize the stress they're experiencing so they can maintain functionality and be a good president, which is why, despite what they might physically look like, they're able to still get things done. The problem with people like Elon Musk and other people that do that as well is these people, if you look at it from a, a very different perspective, is as they climb their ladders of success, the stress is increased is because the way in which they are climbing their ladder of success is from an achievement mindset. Mm. It's from doing things at all costs, creating things on the backs of, of unresolved stress, chronic stress. And that's what most people do is they take the traumas, life experiences, chaos that they've endured as, as a young person, and they build something based on, I'm going to show the world what I really am. I'm going to punish those that did this to me when I was a kid. And, and, and they build everything around that, which is why they actually become more stressful as they become more successful. Because if you truly were a, an elite performer, you would be able to take what it is that you experience and not let it influence your create, creative process, but be something to understand so that you can create something that does not harm others the way you were experiencing harm back in your life. And people don't build businesses from that perspective. They build it from stress and chaos. So as they climb, it only gets worse. It only just ex is exacerbated Whereas what I'm talking about, it should go down is truly eradicating those chronic stresses, battling those demons, if you will, facing your truth, getting to a place where you know how to, like the military, handle yourself in the midst of any chaotic situation, you will experience more peace internally. Therefore, the normal stresses like the president experiences becomes an asset to what you're creating. It does not become something that's detrimental to you that you are constantly like we talked about earlier, you've all battling simultaneously while you're creating. And that's what these people are doing. So they're battling stress, battling their businesses, and they're trying to grow. And they're, it's almost like this leapfrog approach that's actually killing them on the inside. And I've met so many people at the top that have cancer, that are health problems, they're suffering in silence, their, their mindset's fried, they don't know what to do next. And then they go out into the world and they just keep coping and they keep trying to strive, they keep grinding on. And it's like, that is not what we should be respecting and emulating. We should get these people to a place where they no longer experience that uptick of stress with their successes, but they allow themselves to eliminate it as they climb up there and experience that ultimate level of human peace that everybody should be experiencing. That's what I talk about. What a great ending. What a wonderful golden nugget. So Elon Musk, if you're listening, which I'm sure you are, you're too stressed out, man. Call Wiley. He'll fix you up. <laughs> Quickly, radically, yep. Radically. All right. So, Wiley, I'd like to close on my interviews with the following question. Yeah. Who did you have to stop being and who did you need to become to manifest your current success? I think we've heard this a thousand times, but I'm just going to touch on it to answer that question is I needed to stop living and operating for the expectations of others around me, which is what I did at more of a young age. And I, needed to, and I needed to shift my focus on who I really am at the core and what it is that I'm actually here in this world to do first and foremost. And the only way that I was able to get to this place of success in my you know, seven-figure business doing this stuff with these powerful people is because of that discovery of who I really am 
and the fact that I faced my demons, I battled through my life's problems and stresses, I healed my scars and my wounds, and I got to a place of ultimate balance, which is what you're all about, Seven Hats, creating that interwoven connection to all parts of our lives. To me, that's who I had to become, was this balanced, focused, holistic version of me to then turn around and then be able to go out and do this amazing work that I'm providing people out in the world today. That's the only way it was possible. That's awesome. Wiley, tell everybody, tell the seven hatters where they can reach you. I know you have a whole bunch of stuff that you do, uh, especially that retreat in Sedona, which I was extremely intrigued on. So tell the seven hatters what they need to do to get in touch with you. Absolutely. Yeah, I created a, uh, a place for the for your podcast listeners to go. Uh, yourperformancevault.com. It's just a, a plethora of different uh, insights from my experiences working with powerful people so they can start to learn and garner more information and insight in order to not make the same mistakes that those people made. And that's what I put that together for. Uh, we're getting ready to start my own podcast called Whiskey with Wiley, low-key nice. conversations on high-performance living. So we're going to have to stay in touch on that and they can pay and stay tuned for that to come live where you and I can have a conversation. And uh, if they want to, wileymcgraw.com is my website where all my philosophies, insights on about high-performance living uh, are, are now landed. Um, they can find me on LinkedIn for slash Wiley McGraw and also on Twitter at Wiley McGraw. You need to uh, invite my co-founder, Chris Amberian, onto your Whiskey and with Wiley podcast. Okay. <laughs> he'll have some whiskey with you. Uh, no charge. Well, that's the thing is, uh, I, you know, I'm going to be able to, uh, I'm working with some whiskey distilleries right now on possible sponsorships so that they, you know, I'm going to be sending bottles to my guests so we can experience the whiskey on the show in real time and give people that connection to like fireside chat style type uh, conversations on high performance living. So it'll be fun. I love that. Yeah. Wiley, I love you, brother. I think this was, Likewise, my man. this was awesome. I can't wait to, I'm, I'm pretty sure we're going to have you back on. There's so much to talk about. So thank you. Thank that. you. Thank you for You're being a thank guest. You. Yeah. I look forward to the next time, buddy. I hope you enjoyed my conversation with Wiley. Let's end today with the show segment that I refer to as what can we hang our hat on? And here's my takeaway. Wiley and I spoke about his days in the military. And Wiley said that the one thing he learned from his time in combat was how to become in the midst of chaos. He realized that circumstances that are happening around us are reflective of the wars that are going on within us. For Wiley, it was finding the places of peace within, while the rest of the world was in chaos around him. From experience, being an entrepreneur is similar to going into battle. Every day is unexpected and can quickly turn deadly if the entrepreneur is unprepared. Of course, training and experience like in the military will help the situation. But even with experience, the unpredictability of each moment requires a solid state of mind to address the issues at hand. You know, being reactive, which is the default for most leaders, is a major reason for the pain entrepreneurs suffer daily. If you're calm inside, you will have time to think and consider your options more carefully and with a clear state of mind. Wayne Dyer had a great quote. It is in the space between the notes that makes the music. Without that emptiness, that silence in between, there is no music, only noise. End quote. Same with decision making and crisis control. Without that space between the notes, there is only noise. And when there is noise, it's impossible to make wise and confident decisions. I wanted to thank Wiley once again for joining me so that we can all benefit from his wisdom. And until next time, if you found this episode helpful, please hit that subscribe button and tell other entrepreneurs out there what value you receive from it so that we can attract even more high quality people into our Seven Hats community. So for now, I will bid you farewell and success on your journey. And until next time, my name is Yuval Selleck, and I tip my hat to you.